So welcome back to unit three from Myers Psychology for the AP course, Biological Basis of Behavior. And this is going to be module 10 today. It's a rather short module, um, the nervous and endocrine systems. So the learning targets, what you should hopefully understand after listening to this video. You should be able to describe the functions of the nervous system's main divisions and identify the three main types of neurons. You should be able to describe the nature and functions of the endocrine system and its interaction with the nervous system. Um, quickly moving on to just what is the nervous system? Well, the nervous system is the body's speedy electrochemical communication network. It consists of all the nerves of the peripheral and central nervous systems. Neurons are communicating with neurotransmitters making up the body's nerve nervous system, which is that communication network. So you should be thinking like this communication network going on inside of you that takes in information from the world and inside the, from the body's tissues and makes decisions. And then it sends that information and orders it to the body's tissues. What are nerves? <laughs> we hear the term nerves often, like you're getting on my nerves. That's a little bit of a different way to think about it, but kind of related. Um, but what are nerves technically when we're thinking about the biological basis of behavior? They are bundled axons of many neurons that form neural cables connecting the central nervous system, which is often called the CNS, with muscles, glands, and sense organs. For example, the optic nerve in your eye bundles a million axons into a single cable carrying the message, messages from the eye to the brain. So what are the three types of neurons? Well, there are sensory, which are called afferents, and motor neurons, which are called efferents, and then there are interneurons. Information travels in the, in the nervous system through these three types of neurons. The sensory ones carry messages from the body's tissues and sensory receptors inwards, thus they are thought of as afferent, inwards, to the brain and spinal cord for processing. Whereas motor neurons carry instructions from the CNS out to the body's muscles and the body's glands. Okay? They're efferent, they carry messages out. Between the sensory input and motor output, information is processed by the interneurons of the spinal cord and brain. So our complexity as humans sort of resides mostly in these interneurons. Our nervous system has a few million sensory neurons, a few million motor neurons, and just billions and billions of interneurons. So let's kind of look at some differences between those sensory afferent neurons and motor efferent neurons. Sensory neurons contain afferent nerve fibers. They carry information from the sense organs to the central nervous system, where the motor neurons contain efferent neurons. They can carry messages from the central nervous system to the muscles and glands. And this is a, a nice overview, simplistic overview of how the nervous system is divided. Okay, we think about our whole nervous system. It can be initially divided into the peripheral nervous system and the CNS, again, the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system has two main components, the somatic and the autonomic. Okay, the autonomic or somatic nervous system enables voluntary control of our skeletal muscles. On the other side is this, uh, and then the autonomic controls self-regulated action of internal organs and glands. On the other side, the central, on the other side of this picture, not on the other side of our body, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So what is the CNS? And what does it do? What's well, like I said, made up of the brain and the spinal cord. It's the decision maker. It's responsible for coordinating those incoming sensory messages from all over the world and the outgoing messages. So we should be thinking about how it's 
our brain, which is part of the central nervous system, is what enables us to be thinking, feeling, and acting. There are tens of billions of these neurons, each communicating with thousands of other neurons, sort of like changing and yielding and ever-changing wiring within us. So the brain's neurons cluster into work groups called these neural networks. These are these neuron networks with, connect with nearby neurons, which, which have short, fast connections. So they're kind of making little communities together. Each layer cells connect with various cells in the neural network's next layer. So that's within the brain. The other part of the CNS, the spinal cord, is sort of a two-way information highway. I like to think about it and imagine it in that way. It connects the peripheral nervous system and the brain. Ascending neural fibers send up sensory information and descending neural fibers send back motor control information. The pathways, the neural pathways that govern our reflexes, we probably are all fairly familiar from going to for checkups at the doctor with the idea of reflexes. Um, the neural pathways that govern our reflexes are autonomic responses to stimuli. And that is sort of an illustration of the spinal cord's work. So what is the PNS, the peripheral nervous system? Well, it's made up of the sensory and motor neurons. It connects the body to the CNS by gathering information from the senses and transmitting those messages from the CNS. It has two main components, the somatic and autonomic. The somatic, again, enables voluntary control of our skeletal muscles, whereas the autonomic nervous system, the ANS, lots of, lots of uh, abbreviations here, controls our glands and internal organ muscles. The ANS influences functions such as glandular activity, heartbeat, and digestion. And the term autonomic, you should be thinking auto, self, something to do with our self. And autonomic means self-regulation, sort of like an automatic pilot. If we go, if you have any familiarity with flying, lots of pilots use automatic pilot, um, but it, it, it's sort of going on, going by itself without any help. But if you need to, you can consciously override the operations. Um, the autonomic nervous system sub, subdivisions serve two important functions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system are what make it up. So the sympathetic nervous system arouses and expands energy. Think of that fight or flight system. When something happens and you have this desire to fight it, fight it kind of go up against it, or you just want to escape and kind of uh, move away from it, that fight or flight system is within our sympathetic nervous systems. Your parasympathetic nervous system is sort of the opposite effect. It produces the opposite effect. It conserves energy as it calms you. Think rest and digest. So whereas the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight, parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. Sort of when you want to, after you've gone through that really stressful event, whatever that is that triggered your sympathetic nervous system, then the parasympathetic nervous system is like rest and digest. So what are the two parts, again, of the peripheral nervous system? The somatic, which controls the body's skeletal muscles, also called, can be called the skeletal nervous system, although I don't think that is as, as common. And the autonomic, which controls the glands and the muscles of the internal organs, such as the heartbeat. It operates automatically. Next up, we're gonna have a little bit of a quiz. What would you answer? Which division of the peripheral nervous system enables a person to move the muscles necessary to walk down the street? So hopefully from the last few slides, you understand that the answer is D, somatic. Okay, so how is that automatic division further broken down? I just mentioned it, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about it in more detail. The sympathetic nervous system arouses the body, mobilizes its energy, you get fight, flight, or freeze. Think about it in terms of an analogy is the gas pedal of a car. The parasympathetic nervous system is the kind of opposite. It calms the body, conserves your energy. The term you should be thinking about is rest or digest. The analogy to think about is the brake pedal of a car for the parasympathetic nervous system. This is a, um, a, a diagram of the sympathetic arousing 
nervous system versus the parasympathetic calming nervous system. And we can probably all imagine instances of these things happening within our body. And some of us seem to be much more sensitive to having our sympathetic nervous system aroused. Um, and others of us might be have more difficulties, have, you know, activating our parasympathetic nervous system, calming down. Um, even within our own family in my house, I can see big differences in how, how um, the sympathetic nervous system is activated versus the parasympathetic nervous system is activated between individuals. So again, the sympathetic nervous system accelerates heartbeat, raises blood pressure, slows digestion, raises blood sugar, and cools the body. The parasympathetic nervous system decelerates heartbeat, lowers blood pressure, stimulates digestion, processes waste, and calms the body. Another check yourself. What would you answer? Which division of the autonomic nervous system calms a person down once a stressful event has passed? So from the last few slides, we've talked a lot about it. It is A, the parasympathetic nervous system. How do the two parts of the central nervous system function? Okay, so we'll go back to the CNS now. The brain and the spinal cord are what make up the central nervous system. So the brain is comprised of the cortex and the subcortical structures carrying out various functions. We can talk about that a lot more in detail in the next few modules. Nerves arranged into two neural network, into sorry, into neural networks, like people grouping in cities. That's how you can think about it being organized. The spinal cord is a two-way connection, that two-way sort of superhighway between the, P, the, perfor, the PNS and the brain. Oversees the sensory and motor pathways of reflexes. So we're thinking about reflexes, how do they occur? They're so fascinating. How does a reflex occur? So the first step is sense receptors in the skin, send signals up through the spinal cord via the sensory, those afferent neurons. The interneurons and the spinal cord receive the information from the sensory neurons and then send the signals back through the motor neurons. Those efferent motor neurons connect to the muscles in the body and direct the movement. So a simple spinal reflex pathway is composed of a single sensory neuron and a single motor neuron. These often communicate through the interneuron, as I said, the knee-jerk response, for example, the one that you probably had done is some sort of physical involves one such simple pathway, okay? Here's a picture of what a simple reflex, uh, with, you know, kind of a, a diagram of a simple reflex and how it occurs. A simple reflex like that to pain occurs only in the spinal cord before information reaches the brain. When your finger touches a flame, neural activity excited by the heat travels via the sensory neurons to interneurons in your spinal cord. These inner neurons respond by activating motor neurons to the muscles in your arm. Okay. Then you have this sort of simple pain reflex pathway that runs through the spinal cord and right back out. Your hand jerks away from the candle before your brain receives and responds. That's why it feels as if your hand kind of moves away, not even by something that you're thinking about, not by your choice, but almost on its own. So moving from the nervous system to the endocrine system, what is that? I feel like most of us know and have heard a bit about the nervous system and people getting on our nerves, so to speak, but the endocrine system is a less known system. It's the body's slow chemical communication system, a set of glands that secrete hormones into the bloodstream. So, so far we've focused on the body's sort of speedy electrochemical information system, right? With the, with the nervous system. And, but interconnected with that is the endocrine system, the second system uh, that is comprised of our glands that secrete another form of chemical messengers called hormones. And these hormones travel through the bloodstream and affect other tissues, including the brain. And when hormones act on the brain, they influence our interest in things like sex, food, and aggression. So what's the difference between the nervous system and the endocrine system, sort of side by side, if we're trying to differentiate what they are? So neuro neurons release neurotransmitters, as we talked about in module nine. 
glands, uh, endocrine system has glands that secrete hormones. The nervous system has neurotransmitters that move across synapses, where the endocrine system has hormone, hormones that move through the bloodstream. The nervous system um, is very, very fast, whereas the hormone secretion is slower. So thinking about it, like an analogy would be the nervous system, nervous system is more like a text message and the endocrine system is more like an email. But it's important to know that slow and steady sometimes win the, wins the race. Sometimes the endocrine messages outlast the effects of the neural messages. Like if you've ever felt really angry after the cause of your angry feelings were even resolved, um, say someone was really rude to you and you know you kind of are kind of over it, but you still feel really angry at a friend who may have been rude to you, you may have experienced what is sort of known as an endocrine hangover from lingering emotion-related hormones. So just as a quick comprehension check, how would you answer this? Hormones are blank released into the bloodstream. So as we just mentioned in the previous slides, hormones are E, chemical messengers. So next up is a bit of a discussion about the glands within our body. And I know this is kind of sounding like health class a bit, but um, these are important things for us to understand human behavior. So in terms of just looking at this, our main glands, the hypothalamus, which is in the brain, um, it's a region controlling the pituitary gland, which is right over here, which is just absolutely unbelievably important gland, the pituitary gland. It secretes many different hormones, some of which actually affect other glands. Then we've got the thyroid gland that affects our metabolism and the parathyroids that help regulate the level of calcium in the blood. Down here, we've got our adrenal glands that are those things that trigger our fight or flight response. And the, um, on the other side, we've got the pancreas, which regulates the level of blood sugar and the hormones. And then down here, we have the sex glands, the testes in males that secrete male sex hormones, and the ovaries in females that secrete female sex hormones. So the adrenal glands are those ones that I said um, trigger the fight or flight response. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated during one of those fight or flight or freeze events, the adrenal glands re release epinephrine or norepinephrine, adrenaline and noradrenaline to energize the body. So a really interesting fun fact, well, I think it's interesting, is that norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline, is both a hormone and a neurotransmitter. Okay, Nor epinephrine energizes the body, but norepinephrine is released in the PNS to calm the body. So what about that pituitary gland, the one that I said is so very, very, very important. So the hypothalamus is the brain region controlling the pituitary gland, and we're gonna talk more about the hypothalamus in a, few in a few more modules down the line. The pituitary gland secretes many different hormones. So it's, it's the endocrine system's most influential gland. Um, the hypothalamus directs the pituitary gland to regulate growth and control your other endocrine glands. The hypothalamus is part of both the central nervous system and the endocrine system. So the pituitary gland and its secretions, a little bit more information about the pituitary gland because it's the most important one within, uh, within your endocrine system the growth hormone, which regulates growth and metabolism. And sometimes kids can have some problems with their pituitary, pituitary gland that may be contributing to problems with growth. Oxytocin um, is, is stimulates the uterine contractions of childbirth and milk secretion during breastfeeding. It also seems to promote pair bonding, group cohesion, and trust which is very fascinating. Pitu the pituitary gland secretions direct other endocrine glands to secrete their hormones. So you have to think about the pituitary gland of kind of being in control and being directed by the hypothalamus. So, so to review what we just went over in this module 10, um, in terms of describing the functions of the nervous system's main divisions and identifying the three main types of neurons, the CNS, central nervous system, is the brain and the spinal cord. 
the PNS is divided into the somatic and autonomic systems. The sympathetic and parasympathetic are the divisions of the PNS. And there are three types of neurons, sensory, motor, and inner neurons. I, I really suggest taking some time to look at those pictures of how the nervous system is broken down to really be able to visualize that because that's very helpful to understanding this stuff. Finally, um, description of the nature and functions of the endocrine system and its interaction with the nervous system are an important part of this module. The endocrine system secretes hormones into the bloodstream. The adrenal glands releases those hormones that trigger the fight or flight or freeze response. And the pituitary gland is sort of the master gland that's influenced by the hypothalamus. And that brings us to the end of our discussion of module 10. Take care.